We are so honored, right? So we are so honored uh, to be hosting Elizabeth Ween, the uh, Edgar Award-winning uh, novelist, um, and the, whose new book is called The Enigma Game, which has been called historical fiction at its finest uh, by Kirkus Reviews. We are uh, have a lot of good conversation partners by holding a very special place in our heart is Carol Perelman, who is uh, actually, uh, I couldn't imagine anyone else in the universe doing a better job at matching an author. She writes young adult novels, she reviews mystery novels, and she's Scottish. So um, with that said, welcome Elizabeth Ween, welcome Carol Barrowman. Thank you for coming. Give them a big Yay! Yay. Yay. Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to uh, Scotland on Sunday. Um, we are, uh, I'm excited to be here. And I told Elizabeth before I started that I might end up, you know, going in and out of my own Scottish accent because um, I adored this book so, so much. And um, let me just start by saying, um, I did grow up in, and was born and raised um, on the west coast of Scotland, so a little bit farther from where you are, Elizabeth. Little town outside Glasgow, but since I have been home many times, it is now basically a suburb of Glasgow. It doesn't, you know, the city has sort of yeah. spread on into it. So, um, so I was excited. I wanted to tell you just a few minutes why this book um, uh, really excited me. I, my parents, as you know uh, from history, um, were uh, lived near Clyde Bank. So during World War II, both my parents uh, were young children and were shipped off. My mom was shipped to Straven. And um, I'm honestly not quite sure where my dad ended up. But um, so they have uh, very, very vivid memories of the bombings. Um, yeah. uh, and, and when I told my, told my dad in particular that I was, um, I was gonna chat with you about this book, he was so excited. So he's already got dibs on this. Okay. For sure. But the other um, reason that um, I loved it, I started it right after Tuesday, after our election. And um, as you know, we were counting for a lot of days. And this kept me engaged and riveted Yay. through the last <laughs> few days. So it has a double special place in my heart. Not, all, not only is it an exciting and, and great adventure story, it's an, and richly detailed in its history, but it's, um, it's always going to be my election book. Wow. Oh, <laughs> so, that's, that's cool. Yeah, so that's very cool. So I thought, um, my friends, I think what we're going to do is, I have lots of questions, obviously, for Elizabeth, but I thought I asked her if she would start out by giving us her summary elevator pitch, if you will. I know, it, it's, I hate it when people ask you know, me that, but you know I, what? No, no, no. The, the thing is, though, that I'm really, really bad at this, and anybody who has listened in on my, on my um, any of my previous events this week will know that I begin each event by saying, my elevator pitch is terrible. All right. And so how about, how about we just make it not an elevator pitch, but, you know, like hanging out in a bar, in a pub. It's still terrible. It's still but terrible. I'll, do, I'll, I'll give it a go. Okay. Give it a um, go. <laughs> and then when you're done, if you would read a little bit to us, yes, so we have some sense that. of the book before the I ask some the questions. Is, yes. Yeah. Um, so the book is a thriller that's set just after the Battle of Britain. It's set in 1940, November, and it goes on until 1941. And it's basically about a bomber squadron that is sent on missions over the North Sea. And a group of people who come together kind of illegally in the possession of an Enigma machine, a, coding, a German coding machine. And they use this behind the backs of their own intelligence and behind the backs of the Germans to figure out where the U-boats are gonna be and, and where the enemy aircraft is going to be so that the squadron can either go and, and bomb them or avoid them. And the three young people that this book centers around are one of the pilots in the squadron and a young woman who is a driver for the, for the Royal Air Force Squadron who is of Scottish traveler heritage. And the third is a 15 year old girl of mixed Jamaican English heritage whose parents have both been killed in the Blitz and who has come to this tiny village near the airfield in Scotland to work as a carer for an old woman who is a German refugee. 
So there's all these different people coming together and they get hold of this Enigma machine. And that is my extended elevator pitch. I think, I think that was pretty well done. That was good. That was good. Thank I'm going to add a few things as we go Thanks. along, but that was really good. So um, do you have a little section you would read to us? I, I do. And, and um, I've been trying to change this up a bit. I know there are some people who have, um, who have joined me before, um, but the sections that I have been reading are Louise's. Uh, the three young people actually take turns narrating the story. And Louisa is the, the uh, Jamaican immigrant who ends up in Scotland. And she's really, she has the majority of the narrative and she's kind of the character that I think most young readers will relate to the most. She's, she's sort of the youngest and she's the one who doesn't, she's, you know, just finished school and really kind of because the school has closed because of the bombing, you know, not because of choice. And she's the one who was having to break out and make a life for herself. So, um, this is a page and a half from when she has just turned up at the pub with this 82 year old German refugee who needs help walking in tow. And when they get there, they discover that there's this kind of mini invasion go going on as a German pilot has landed at their airfield on apparently some kind of intelligence mission. Um, very, very hush hush. And he has come to this pub where they're all staying because that's where he's supposed to meet his contact. So this is their first night there. It's been kind of a wild ride and the everybody's gone off to kind of lock themselves into their bedrooms because there's this strange enemy pilot staying with them with a gun. And one of the things that he insists on doing is taking the record player that the old woman has brought with her into his room. So Louisa is the first time sleeping in this pub and she is kind of listening to this German pilot in the other room playing these records. Felix Baer looked exhausted, but he didn't go to sleep right away. I know because I heard him playing records for half the night. Beside me in room five's mysteriously lumpy bed with the musty mattress, you could smell damp in it through the clean bedclothes. Jane was asleep, I think, the moment her head hit the pillow. Not me. It was the second longest day of my life after the day when the bomb dropped in Balham and Mummy was killed. I dozed off in the unfamiliar bed next to this unfamiliar old woman, but I kept waking and hearing the music in room four, record after record. I'd fall asleep listening to Mozart, and I'd wake up and hear Ravel or Cole Porter or some German song I didn't recognize. Felix Baer, the German pilot, couldn't have slept at all because he kept changing records and winding the gramophone. Perhaps he was keeping himself awake on purpose, waiting for his contact from intelligence. The music was only a lullaby lilt through the closed doors in the passage between us, but it must have been jolly loud in the room where he was playing it. By and by, I noticed that most of what he played, most of Jane's records actually, were all forbidden in Germany now. So he was treating himself to a feast of beautiful music from before the war, from before the Nazis, when people could listen to whatever they liked. I wanted to hate him, but the music made my heart soar and I remembered the warm touch of his palm against mine and his bony fingers flying over the piano keys. What was it like to be a musician and not be able to play music you love? I thought of my flute and all it meant to me, lessons with mummy, duets with daddy, sitting on the roof of the flat in London trying to imitate the starlings at dusk when I should have been practicing. I drifted off once more and this time when I woke, I heard nothing but the wind in the scotch pines on the knoll above the limehouse and Jane gently snoring beside me. Felix Bear was finished playing records. I knew there wasn't a thing Jane could do if that German decided to shoot us in our sleep, but I didn't think he would, not after she let him share her music. Lying next to her, I felt like I was in the safest place in the house. 
Wonderful. Yay. That was very good. And I am, I'm really glad that you picked that piece because I think in that little section, you, almost all the themes of, your, of the story are, are evolving right there. You've got the relationships um, and, and Louisa I love as a character, but you've also got the history and music. This book is full of music. Too. Yeah. You know, and every reading that I've done this week, I think has, has been about music. <laughs> it it is a theme. Yeah. So do you have some vinyl records of your own that you collect? Uh, well, I mean, I have all the vinyl records that like, you know, you grew up with. I grew up with. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I don't go, I don't go seeking them out regularly. I just play the ones that I have, but yeah, I mean, we've got, we've got tons of, tons of, um, tons of record players. <laughs> like we have more than one record player. That's very cool. Yeah, so, I have one I can plug into my computer. Well, that's even better. That's yeah. that's even better. So let's start with Louisa since she's um since th she's the focus here. I read somewhere, and I think it, it's in your acknowledgments at the back of the book, that that this story, the kernel of the story, started with an old woman. You wanted to write about an old woman and a young person. Could you speak a little bit about why and how you got to that starting point? I, well, for one thing, I kind of feel like old people just aren't given enough credit. <laughs> in, in, in much the same way- I agree, way as young, I'm getting older. <laughs> in much the same way that young people aren't given enough credit. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, I also have had a wonderful relationship with, with the kind of number one old person in my life, who was my grandmother, who raised me. And she, uh, my mother died when I was 14 and my grandmother, my maternal grandmother took me in and she lived for, I don't know, another 45 years after that or something. She, she died in 2015 at the age of 98. Wow. So she's been, you know, a force throughout my life. And it was partly wanting to kind of celebrate that and, and explore that and how, how, People stay young when they are involved with youth, um, which I is something that I think was very true of my grandmother as well. I, I, initially, I imagined something that maybe took place at Bletchley Park, and there was you know sort of a young coder who was going to have to have some kind of uh, she was going to have maybe an elderly person that she was taking care of, a, a relative maybe. Um, eventually, it, it turned into this. Well, I, I like that, that it turned into this because one of the things that, that I saw, one of the patterns across the whole book is that everybody's in disguise in some way, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, they're all hiding things. They're all hiding yeah. things yeah. and some physically, some not, some, um, you know, in terms of, of their background. And um, did you have that, that, all those sort of dichotomies worked out as you were going along? No, I, I you know, people ask, are you a pantser or a plotter? And I'm a pantser. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I knew to a certain extent that this book was about prejudice. I mean, it was, it was going to be obvious that that was going to be a feature in it because I had a character who was mixed race and she's not my first mixed race character. Um, and I, think that I tend to gravitate, I, every book I've ever written is about a character who's not at home in their home place. There's like, they have some connection to another country for some reason or other. And I think this is because that's who I am. Um, and so I knew I was gonna have to like deal with whatever was going on in terms of racial prejudice in the UK at the time. But there are other, prejudices as well that I wanted to deal with in contrast with that. And um, Ellen McEwen, the, the traveler character, the Scottish character, is a character who appeared in one of my previous novels, The Pearl Thief, um, which was more focused on traveler culture than, than you really get in the Enigma game. But it was interesting to pick her up and then have her suddenly go, and, and this wasn't something that, this wasn't something that I in fact, even in one of my early drafts, I think she was still being very straightforward about her heritage. And it occurred to me in like the second or third draft of the novel that if she was hiding that, she would have a basis on which to relate to not only Louisa who can't hide her differences, you know, because they're physical, um, but also to Jane 
who is of German origin and is trying to hide that. Right. And um, yeah, and, and so there were all kinds of things going on there. Well, and it, there. One of the reasons that I think this would be a wonderful book to teach in a, in a class too, um, is you, you have the, a range of, of adults and you have a range of um, um, teenagers or younger, young adults, but you also have a range of, of the prejudices that they have to deal yeah. with. You know, there's sexism, there's racism, there's classism. I mean, yep. James struggles, struggles with that, right? He's yep. trying to, um, and then there's the whole, the whole issue of, um, you know, taking orders and, and how, and yeah. And I love that Louisa every now and then says, my mom, her mother taught her to be polite and, uh, but you could still break rules. Right. Uh, and uh, so how, let's talk a little bit about Jane then. Um, as, as, as a character. Now you talked about your grand, your grandmother and, mm -hmm. and being a ferocious older woman. I love, I love Jane. I could see Jane so vividly in that, in that pub. I could hear her voice. Tell us, tell us a little bit about Jane and how she evolved. So, so Jane, I'm trying to, trying to remember what made me think she was German. And I, I, I guess it was really because I was kind of fascinated um, with this idea that the British had had uh, internment camps for aliens and refugees uh, during both wars. And so I wanted someone who I was going to have to stick in an internment camp. <laughs> And, and they, it turned out that they actually um, kind of shut them all down at about the time that Jane is released, which is quite early in the war. Um, so around the end of 1940. And it, and that made it very convenient to, you know, sort of have her be the person um, that Louisa was going to look after. And then I could just kind of play with that and explore that. But then I had to make up a, a background for her. And I had this, I had in my head that I wanted music to be a theme. So she was going to be a musician of some kind. I think kind of early on, she was going to be like a classical violinist or a cellist or something like that. And I ended up making her an opera singer. I cannot remember why I did that. <laughs> but you when, uh, no, no, not, not like to any kind of professional <laughs> standard. No, <laughs> I sing in a choir. <laughs> Um, what, what really kind of came in and, and, and finessed her character was when I was trying to work out the, the, the decoding aspect of it. Okay. So the, the, the bit where they have this coding machine and they have to figure out how it works. And part of the way it works is that every, um, is that the messages that come in that they decode are all sent via Morse. And so then I'm like looking into Morse code and thinking about Morse code. And I'm thinking it'd be really handy if Louisa learned some Morse code. And I thought like, why is she gonna do that? And how is she gonna do that? And one of the ridiculous things that I did when I was um, doing the background research for this book was I taught myself Morse code. Wow. And which was, which was actually, <sighs> I, I, I don't want to say it was a useful thing to have done because like as far as I can tell it was not really very useful <laughs> but <laughs> but it's really hard it's easy enough to memorize the letters okay so it's like easy enough to remember what the letters are and to transmit them and I didn't go like that to transmit them um, with your little Morse coding machine which I haven't got um, but it's really really hard to translate them in your head when you're listening to Morse code. And it, I think it must take a, a, a lot of practice before you're able to do that fluently. And so I discovered that in the early days of electronic communication, and by the early days, I mean like the 1860s, 1870s, that's how people communicated when they were you know, working in telegraph offices. And it was a job that young girls could do. And it was a job that they became really, really good at. And so I suddenly thought, my gosh, Jane could have been a telegraph operator in 1870, you know, when she was 20 years old. And so that, that 
really just kind of brought it all together because it meant that she had a skill. She suddenly she had like a much more interesting and complicated background. So this is before she's a famous opera singer. And she, it also makes her independent right through her life. And it also means that she can teach Louisa Morse code. <laughs> it's important to the, sto to the story. Right. But also, it, it also meant that she had uh, a connection with um, Louisa that you wouldn't, that, that, if, that comes quite quickly in the- The musical the, connection, the, yes. The, the musical connection, but when she goes to pick her up at the internment um, camp, that she recognizes a look and, and a stance in Louisa that mm -hmm. because she's a, a young woman doing something she should that she shouldn't be doing. And on top of that, she's of mixed race. So I, I felt like they became friends um, and, and connected to each other very, very quickly mm -hmm. because of all of those aspects of that. Um, before we leave that bedroom where we- <laughs> um, I, A lot happens there, actually. <laughs> yeah, a lot happens in that, in, that, in that rooming house and in that pub, yeah. Really, yeah. right? Um, I'll come, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but um, tell, tell us a little more about, um, the more I learned about you, the more I realized there's lots of Louisa in, I mean, there's a lot of real connections. Can you speak to some of those? You, you spent a lot of time in uh, Jamaica. Yeah, so I mean, this is why, this is why my character is Jamaican. Um, I, my father, Norman Ween, worked for the New York City Board of Education for most of his life, and he was sent to Manchester in England for two years to help organize the Head Start program there in the 1960s. And he was then sent to the University of the West Indies to do the same thing in Kingston, in Jamaica. And so we lived there from 1970 to 1973. And I, I didn't actually start school there. I started school in England, but I completed my first year of school there and, and went to school there for three years. And when I came to the United States, I was nine years old, and uh, and it was it was culture shock for me. You know, I I mean I was an American citizen, but I had no memory of ever having lived in the United States. So I drew on my own experience a lot for Louise's experience of moving from a warm country to a cold one, basically. Yeah. And from a place where, where I was really very unaware of racial tension. And you'd think that I would have been more aware of it, but I wasn't. I was, I was shielded from it. I went to a, uh, a Quaker school. I started actually in a, in a um, school that was attached to a teacher college, a huh. uh, teaching college, um, which was just the local school. Right. And I then went to a Quaker school where like kids from all over the world and, you know, every imaginable race and religion were, um, despite the fact it was a Quaker school, they were just, it was full of lots of kids who all we had in common was that we happened to live in Kingston. Um, and when I came to the United States, it was, it was 1973. So it was, you know, just barely after the civil rights movement. Right, right. And it was a very, very different experience. Yeah, I, I found that, I found some of the, 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 the richest historical moments in the book for me were when she remember, has memories of, um, of her childhood and memories of her parents that you weave in so beautifully into all of this, I mean, the Scottish history and the, the Luftwaffe and all that's fascinating, and, and I've got, we'll come to that. But for me, some of these real smaller details mm -hmm. that, um, that just reveal something about what it means to be a teenager who's really cut adrift from a culture, and, and not just her parents, um, yeah. from everything that she's known, and she's She's got a sense of identity. And that's the other thing I really liked about Louisa is that she is looking to find out her purpose. But she, it's in a lot of young adult novels, you, the, the, the main female character is often looking to establish her identity, right? And I felt like Louisa, 
obviously she's working on that, but she has a real strong sense of who she is. I, I think that to tell the truth, I think that's true of all my characters. I, I, I think that very few, very few of my characters don't know who they are. <laughs> and, but for someone like Louisa, and indeed um, it, it, it's making me want to talk about um, the, the hero of some of my earlier books. I have a, a series of books that are set in sixth century Ethiopia. And the, the hero of these books is named Telemachus and he's King Arthur's grandson. He's the son of Arthur's son and an Ethiopian noblewoman. So he's half British and half Ethiopian. I will have to put that on my... <laughs> Um, the sun the sunbird okay i think the sunbird okay. is one of the best sunbird. books i've ever written and it's not very long either um and and this is something telemachus is is you know shunned by both sides because he's not one or the other but he also has a very he has very strong ties to his family and to the people that he does form relationships with you know he's like incredibly loyal and he knows who he is. And I'm, and I, when I was writing those books, I felt that was very important to create a character who wasn't going to be miserable all the time. Right. And I think it was also important for Louisa to have a strong sense of who she is and where she belongs in her family, if not the world. So right. she, one of the things you talked about her, her memories of Jamaica. She has a place back in Jamaica. She knows she can't live there. She knows that she's too, I want to say westernized, although that doesn't actually make sense in the context. She's too anglicized. Right. You right. know, she's, she's, she's lived in London since she was nine years old. And is it nine or 12? No, I'm mixing her up with me. <laughs> <I'm not> <laughs> she's lived in London since she was 12 years old. And... She has acquired an English accent that has erased all trace of her Jamaican accent, which is kind of what happened to me when I when I went um, when I left Jamaica. I, when I left Jamaica, I was fluent in Jamaican patois. Wow! And I think that the reason my accent has atrophied into what you hear now is because I was so demonized for that accent um I won't go into that now but well, yeah it was just like I I had to learn to talk like everybody else and yeah, I think and honestly, Louisa has done exactly the same thing honestly we share that background um uh, my brother and I both had he got a lot more bullying than I did because he was uh, he was a little bit younger and I I was um heading into university you know I was almost 18 and so I had um, I had a little more power behind my physical self, but um, we often talk about the reason we, we switch, we call it being bi-dialectical. <laughs> you know, so the reason we switch, um, you know, if, if I'm talking to my parents, I immediately sound like I just got off the train from Glasgow, I, that's just how I sound. But when I talk to my students here at Alverno, I'm, I'm very much sound uh, uh, like I was from the Midwest. But I think that's a share. I think that's a shared thing for a lot of children who are, you don't want to sound different. Yeah. Louisa, yeah. on top of everything else, looks different. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, um, so so let's let's move on a, li a little bit in um, the uh, talk a little bit about the history part. I, I mean, obviously, all of this is the history, but um, I was fascinated by how much I didn't know about the, <laughs> some of these um, bomb, you know, bombing raids, other than the stories I've heard from my parents. Um, why this why this particular focus? Um, I know you love it was. Okay, so it was a coincidence. It was because when I wrote Codename Verity, so the, the character of Jamie, the, the young squadron leader pilot, um, who is one of the narrators, what is the brother of the Verity character in Codename Verity, if, you, if anybody listening doesn't already realize that. And in Codename Verity, um, which actually takes place after the Enigma game, Certain things go down, and I, I apologize for these stupid earbuds which keep falling out. <laughs> and he he is 
he's moved on in the war, but it's mentioned that when he started out, he was flying Blenheim bombers. Now, clearly what I did at the time was a quick Google search for British RAF air bomber. Maybe I put twin engine in there. I don't know. Um, beginning of World War II. And that's what I came up with. And it was the right answer, but I didn't know anything about these planes. And so I was, when I decided to use Jamie, which I did because I thought, oh, that'd be so much fun to revisit this character. Um, I was stuck with these planes. And that's what made me have to go and research what they were doing at that point in the war, where they'd be based um, and what it was like to fly them and to, and to fight in them. It is so amazing. The, those sections of the book are, I mean, a lot of the book is unput downable, but I, I just felt, pardon the pun, flying through those sections <laughs> because, and, and, and I'm, I love books with cars in them and there aren't any <laughs> cars in this book and I, and, but the planes and the detail and, and some of the really most moving scenes when, when um, right at the very beginning, of course, with Jamie and his, um, his gunner, I'm sure I'll get wrong the information, the, what they're called. No, that's right. Yeah. And so the, 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 it, it, the whole op opening few scenes of this novel are, um, I cannot imagine if you were to use this in a class that um, young readers would be just zipping through it because they just want the, it, it's very much I had a lot of nostalgia for it because I <laughs> adventure books you know three must yeah and and even yeah. back in the day the secret seven and yeah 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 all so those kinds of books. how much fun is it to write an air battle I mean <laughs> I said it was great and this, I mean, this actually was quite an indulgence for me because I, I am known for writing books about um, women pilots. I have, I have only just kind of like, I, I wrote a very short book about a Soviet woman pilot, but for the most part, they don't get to take part in the battles. So having, having a boy's point of view um, <laughs> as a pilot actually gave me a chance to be a bit more indulgent that way. So, well, yeah, I mean, that's like the, the Star Wars right? fan in me coming in. Well, and, and yeah. I have to say the other, the only other thing, and I've got a list now of all the things of yours that I'm going to have to catch up on, but I had read your Rose, um, your Star Wars book, uh, comic, graphic novel the about Rose. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I loved Rose ca Rose's character. And my book, my book isn't a graphic novel. My, my it's, um, what is it? Cobalt Squadron. Co right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cobalt Squ Squadron. I, I didn't want, I didn't want reader, listeners to get get excited thinking I'd written a, a graphic novel. Right, no, like, but, but, uh, um, but I was I was so excited when I saw that you had taken and given some backstory to Rose and her sister. That book was so fun to write too. Oh, oh. my gosh. Cobalt Squadron yeah. was, was a blast. And because it, it was actually, I wrote it just before I wrote the Enigma game. So they were actually my first bomber squadron. Well, I think that's awesome. Now there's a, a nerd connection. I, I'm yeah. a big Star Wars <laughs> And, and since I'm making some nerdy connect connections, um, when I first started reading this book, I had just watched Enola Holmes on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And I think your book has a very strong same sense of um, time and pl obviously it's a different time, but same sense of place and, 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 and just enough history to get you involved and so on. I, I, I was, I've compared it a couple of times to friends. If you enjoyed Enola Holmes, you're mm. going to love this book. You're going to cool. love this book. Yeah. So, um, setting in Scotland, um, uh -huh. tell us a little bit about, um, uh, does the, the, did the air base, does it exist? Did it exist? Or? It can't, it, okay, it doesn't exist. It's a made up air base. Um, I, I did one of those things that you sometimes do when you're, when you're making up a story and you like ignore a really, really obvious thing until after the book is published or nearly published. And that is the train line uh -huh. that runs up the East Coast for some magical reason, doesn't run through Windy Edge. <laughs> and, and husband, I mean, they talk about the train line all the time. The train line gets bombed. They have to go out there and look at it. I mean, what was I thinking? Um, so I, I like inserted <laughs> last minute some line about how they, 
they um, how it runs inland there, <laughs> which it doesn't do. <laughs> but right. it, you're writing fiction. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, it's a made-up place, but it is based on a real place, which is Montreux. It's Montrose Airfield, um, which is south of Aberdeen, and they have a wonderful website and a wonderful museum um, called the Montrose Air Heritage Center, I think, um, which you can go and explore online. And it is, I believe, the oldest, I think it's the oldest, um, is, wouldn't have been a Royal Air Force base at the time. It's a, a Royal Flying Corps base when it opened, but I believe it's been open since 1913, something ridiculous like that, and it has ghosts. Mm. <laughs> Better. Um, it's, they no longer fly from there, but um, they, it, it was an airfield during both wars, both world wars. So it's, it's, it's kind of based on that. And it is right there on the, on the North Sea coast. And then there's um, the airfield that they refer to sometimes as kind of their sister airfield. Half of the squadron is based um, in a place called D-Side. Right, yeah. That's a made up place as well, but it's based on DICE, which is actually now the, the passenger commercial airport for, for Aberdeen. Wow, that's amazing, that's amazing. So before, uh, uh, let me just remind all of our um, uh, folks that are here, um, the ghosts or the planes no longer fly from there, somebody's <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that, I, I, it's too bad about the ghosts. But... No, the ghosts, no, the ghosts are still there. The ghosts are still there. The planes don't fly there anymore. You might see a ghost plane, but. <laughs> well, there's your next book, which is my next question. What are you working on right now? And before, mm -hmm. before you um, answer, let me just ask all of you who are um, listening and enjoying this conversation with Elizabeth, if you have some questions, I'm going to open it up for some questions in a few minutes. Um, uh, but Elizabeth, go ahead, Elizabeth, tell us about that. Well, I'm not allowed to. <laughs> I am, I am working on, I am working on another book about flying. I have a deadline. Okay. Um, it is, the deadline is October 1st of this year. Uh, I love that like <laughs> whizzing past your head, right? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm writing the last scene now. Oh, awesome. Okay. Well, and it is, my editor said, I'm not going to tell you anything about it because it, no. I'm not supposed to. Um, it hasn't been announced. So maybe don't there say, is don't, well, I don't want you to get in trouble with your editor. I'm not going to get in trouble, <laughs> but, but it, her, her question, to her, her, what, her exhortation to me, she may be listening to this, her <laughs> exhortation to me was write something, write something that's really more adventure, more of a thriller, get into the, the flight aspect and the aspect. She, yeah, well, she said, actually, one of the things she said was, that her favorite parts of the Enigma game were the Louisa parts. So she wants to be, she wanted to be in the head of another character like that and having a having a romp. And I think that's what I've produced. So. I, and I love that you've described it as a romp because I think uh, uh, there's uh, adventure stories for girls or young uh, young women. We need as many of them as we can I'll get. I'll tell you what, this thing that I've written, it's like, it it's, this won't mean anything to American readers, but it will to you probably. It's Biggles for Girls. Ah! <laughs> it's it's like the 1930s, like girls go flying adventure stories that you sometimes see the covers printed on on tote bags. Yeah. You know? yep. Except I it's updated and it's and it's not got all the all the you know sort of so it, is it is it historical it was, fiction or not? It's historical fiction. It's, it's set in the 1930s. Okay, very cool. Which is which is a, an amazing time period to have adventures in that you can you know and and so that that's really my um la, my my last question. Um, do you approach writing historical fiction differently? I mean, I think that's mostly what you've ri written, but a lot of times. Um, People will ask, I'm, I'm finishing a book set in the Civil War right now, and people will say, well, do you have a different set of responsibilities as a fiction writer when it's historical fiction? I, I don't think you do. I think you have the same set of responsibilities. I mean, and, and, you know, I feel like 
my responsibilities are to get the stuff accurate, but I would struggle to get stuff accurate if I was writing something set today in another state, you know, or, or in a, in a, I don't know, some, you know, in a ballet company or, you know, anything that I wasn't, that I wasn't familiar with myself, I would still feel that I had to, that I had to somehow work out how to, how to get those details right. But what your question kind of touches on something else, which is that like, is the, the story any different because it's historical fiction? And that is something that I have never felt. And if you think about it, I came to writing historical fiction through writing Arthurian fantasy. Mm -hmm. And I, my early, my very first book is actually set in King Arthur's court and then moves on from there to, to like his grandchildren. And those books I never thought of as historical fiction, although I did a lot of background research for them mm -hmm. um, because I had kind of taken the fantasy element out of them and was quite enjoying managing to, to add in this like element that felt fantastical but wasn't almost as though I was writing <laughs> and, and I consciously felt this way that I was kind of like writing the history that right. the fantasies are based on. Um, so, Which so is, yeah, yeah, really cool. And I was just in it. I, I was just doing it because I loved the story and I loved the characters and I loved coming up with the adventure, you know, so that, and that just because I'm setting it in a different time, which is a more familiar historical right. period to us. Yeah. Um, doesn't really change the way I think about the characters. That's great. That's great. We have a question that came in from email and it says, will you write more about the three characters in Enigma, please? Well, my <laughs> next book isn't about them. <laughs> so, have to just, but um, if you, if you, if this person who sent, who sent in the email um, doesn't know my other books, right. they should go to my other books because Codename Verity has got a couple of the characters from the Enigma game in it. Um, and I, Jamie being one of them, the other one you can figure out yourself. <laughs> and the Pearl Thief also has um, characters from the Enigma game in it. And Ellen in particular um, has, has a, quite a large role in the Pearl Thief. Yeah. Um, and, and Jamie does too. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, we don't want to give away spoilers by saying um, other characters. So yeah, so like anybody who's read Code Name Verity is not like, ooh. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, I, 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 do we have any other questions from our um, gallery here? Um, anyone else have a, a question for Elizabeth? One of the things that I, I wanted to actually just, just speak to was um, Lindsay had, had said, I love the loose connections between books, despite them not being sequels, and mentioning Madeline Langell. And yes, that is, I don't think I consciously was thinking of Madeline Langle so much as maybe Rosemary Sutcliffe when ah. I when I yeah. wrote, when when I do those connections but I um I definitely appreciated that as as a young reader I loved the way all her all her families and books connected and do you know what it's something that is actually is actually harder to do now because if you want to sell your movie rights, you end up selling the rights with of one book. Right. You see everything else that is connected to it goes along with that, right. which actually makes it very hard to, for agents to untangle. And you know, kind of like if one book doesn't get made into a movie, none of the other five are either. Um, so I consciously have written a couple of books that don't have that connection, which I find very frustrating because I want them all to be very, very interesting. Right, That's, it's, it's a, your world building. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. Historically yeah. world building, you know, over great spans of time. I wanted to take that German guy, Felix Baer. Yeah. I wanted to take him and, and have him um, be, actually I wanted him to be part of the book I was writing now. I, want, I ah. wanted him to have a role in it at a younger age. And I said, no, can't. 
can't do that. Well, and th that just reminds me of one other thing that I loved so much about this book. There, obviously, there's there's um, it's a spy thriller, but there's all sorts of little puzzle piece puzzle things too that the for solving. Like, and you mentioned Felix Bear's name. I don't want to give anything away, but there's wonderful puzzle like details in this novel that I really enjoyed too. So. Um, I loved Rose Under Fire, and I'm wondering if you could talk about how that novel came to be. It was hard to read at times, but so important. And that's from Morgan. Thanks, Morgan. So the way, what happened was when I was doing the research for Codename Verity, which if you don't know it, and I think probably most people listening on this call do know it, but the research for Codename Verity, it's about a young woman who's working as an agent in occupied Europe and she's working for the UK government and is uh, basically a spy and a saboteur in, in Nazi occupied Europe. And when I was doing the research for it, although Codename Verity does not end this way, I found that the end of the story for almost all the young women who did that job was that they were taken prisoner and sent to concentration camps. Mm -hmm. And and in particular to Robinsburg, which is where a lot of Rose Under Fire takes place. And so I felt kind of like that was the second half of that story, which I hadn't told and which I really, really felt I needed to tell. And I had, it, kind of ridiculously, when I was about 12 years old, I made up a very, very epic World War II adventure, which I never wrote anything down in. Um, there's like 200 words total that I wrote, but I drew all these little sketches for it, which is like drives you nuts now when you go back and you look at them because you don't know what the story is. <laughs> <laughs> but I, the first half of that story is Codename Verity and the second half is Rose Under Fire. So it also both those books for me was a very comfortable is not the right word, but very familiar headspace for me to be in when, when I wrote them. And actually there were, there were a ton of kind of like in joke little nods that I made to myself in writing Codename Verity. Like I gave the, the sort of iconic orange sweater the, the, the character, the spy character is wearing throughout the, throughout the novel. Um, was the orange sweater that my character wore in <laughs> in this ridiculous story that I wrote when I was 12. Um, so yeah, it, it like the, the name Robinsburg had actually kind of gone out of my head. And when I saw it, I was just like, oh yes, I remember. I spent a lot of time there in my mind when I was an adolescent. Yeah. Um, and it you know, kind of all came back. And then of course I started doing research on it, but that's, that's really how it came about. And this is an interesting little piece of trivia, but originally I just came across this. Um, I had gone on a kind of writing retreat about 10 years ago this week. Mm -hmm. And one of my goals for myself was to work on or write the first chapter for Maddie's book. And I was like, oh, what's that? I was working on Code Name Verity then. No, I wasn't. I was like, oh no, that's Rose Under Fire. Originally, wow. the Rose character was going to be Maddie. Interesting. And I had, my British editor at the time said, Maddie can't be this character, she's too old. <laughs> she basically said, you know, she's going to be like 25 by the time this book ends. It's too old for a YA novel. Um, so I made up Rose, who was an original character. And Maddie actually does appear in the book, as you'll know if you've read it. But having Rose be the central character was very liberating because it gave me a way to use poetry in the book because Maddie just couldn't be a poet and Rose already was. And that was actually something that I felt was hugely important to the writing of that book because it was so important to the, the prisoners um, who mm -hmm. were actually in that camp and in other concentration camps as well. Yeah, so which I really kind of, wanted to. Which kind of brings us back to the notion of not just layering poetry in, but in this book, music, because it's mm. it, 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 it's an important part of our 
inner beings too and and there's such a rich inner life that that, that comes through on in this novel too for all the characters elizabeth this has been a pleasure and i am i'm calling this my gateway book now because i am going planning to um go back and figure out everything else that you've written from this ah uh, yay <laughs> daniel if you if you've missed it daniel has posted a link for us all on here if you want to ask buy a copy of this book um i'm gonna have to do that because my dad wants this copy and i'm gonna need to have my own so um elizabeth it was a pleasure thank you all for coming and joining us this afternoon and um, I had fun and Sunday in Scotland, and I'm going to throw this back to Daniel. Elizabeth, it's really been a delight. Uh, Thank you, Carol. I'm just, I'm so pleased that you were able to, to join me and uh, that, you know, you enjoyed the book and it's yeah, great to meet you much. virtually. Yeah, and yeah. thank you also, Daniel, for hosting We this. are honored to host you. We also wanted to mention that uh, we do have signed book plates, so... Um, so please, uh, when you um, order your book, um, just put a little, we try to stick them in each book, but just uh, just put a little note in special instructions if you're doing it by our website or when you're calling and saying, I want that book plate. So <laughs> and we will get you one. Oh, um, we have to make, the Lindsay just posted on the chat here. Thanks for inspiring me to become a pilot. Lindsay, oh. I, Lindsay, I actually know who you are, recognize your name. And, and I use the story of you, of you, um, taking your inspiration from Codename Verity I, many times. It just like, awesome. I cannot believe that, um, that, something that I wrote could change someone's life like that. So That's amazing. Oh, it really is amazing. Yeah. So thank you, Carol. Thank you, Welcome. Elizabeth. I mean, um, thanks to all of you for joining us today. We wouldn't have a virtual bookstore without you. Hope to see you another event. Uh, looking forward to future books from both our conversation partner and our author today. So thanks thank again. You have a good rest of your day. Get this book. <laughs> Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.